So down in uh, Australia and New Zealand carried out a research study um, on all of the incidents with mobile plant that we had. It was called uh, pedestrian plant interface and it was quite complicated so we've streamlined it down to uh, guidelines around mobile plant. Um, what we found from the research is that we, um, well what we knew, this was confirmed by the research um, in New Zealand and these are just only the New Zealand stats for, the, uh, for five years, uh, we found that we had incidents where uh, pedestrians involved with mobile plant or moving mobile plant was at 5.7% uh, and that means that we've had some sort of um, interaction between the plant or an near miss. What we're finding in the industry along with everybody else here um, is we have um, your procedure and then you have your actual man following the procedure and they don't always, um, one doesn't actually know the other exists or they don't meet in the middle. So what we're trying to do is just focus on this person here and make sure that he understands what he needs to. And that's why I like this, uh, what uh, we've come up with. Um, we'll, what we've done in Downer is um, we've come up with no-go zones and exclusion zones. Um, it's a very, very, very simple idea. When the plant is moving, there is a no-go zone around it, whether it's in its pathway or um, a distance beside it, um, and nobody can go into it. Very, very simple. So nobody can approach that plant or be in close proximity. Once the plant stops, that no-go zone disappears. So it works with the, um, with the supervisor, supervisors out, out there that need to talk to an operator. They have to wait till it stops. The threat is uh, uh, isolated then. Um, then we have an exclusion zones. Now you are allowed in an exclusion zone, um, but you have to have some sort of tra uh, formal training. Um, so, and again, uh, when I put up the next slide, you'll see uh, how that sort of works. So this is some, uh, some illustrations of how that would work. And again, like I said, keep it simple, um, get the message out there and make it easy to interpret. Um, as you see here, we've got a roller and a grader. They move back and forth. Uh, when they're moving, the red zones are the no-go zones. Very, very simple. That's what a, a vehicle movement plan looks like. You've got your entry and your exit, you make sure it's a one way, um, you know where the cars are parked, you know where the, uh, you, you would shade in the areas where um, you wouldn't allow pedestrian foot traffic, um, distinguishing between no-go zones and exclusion zones, and it'd be nice and tidy like that. The reality is, it's gonna look like that. This is what I want. And this is what I want to see, is that our guys are thinking it through. Very simple sketches, big lines, can't be misinterpreted. You can see over in the corner there, there's a sign-in sheet, um, no-go zone, big letters. Some of the good things we've found, already in existence, again this is in both Auckland and Canterbury, we want to make sure it's sort of a national front. Operator competency is pretty good. Trade qualifications in most cases, where they exist, which is mostly with crane and um, mobile elevator working plant. Induction and training on machines, we're sort of 50-50 on that. Um, we might have um, an operator done a course, have a card, but you know, really doesn't know the, the, the machine itself. You know, machine for memorization is, is, is an issue with us that we're looking at. Attitude on size has been pretty good. We've been welcomed. I think they had a lot to do with our um, communication stakeholder team sending out the, um, the tool prior to our kickoff, make sure that they're up to date with what we're doing and what we're looking for. This is definitely a collaboration. It's not us uh, hiding and trying to catch anyone out at all. And um, the general condition of machines too. So um, we'd found that um, the trend is that those machines owned by companies and with their own employees had a very good standard of certification um, and condition of their machines. Attitude on sites, general um, hazard controls, communication, this is a good thing to see. In fact, there's a site across the road, no one's allowed near where the riggers are. It's totally excluded out. No one's walking underneath. Crane's in operation. You know, pretty good um, planning. Um, the bad, so there is a reverse side. Again, this is a smaller percentage from what I just spoke to, but similarly, um, we're coming across too many people who have done a course and can't explain the emergency procedures or the bleed-out valve or what do you do if you're in this particular EWP and we need to get you down. 
bit of a lack of understanding around how to use that PPE. Um, it's good to see people in harnesses, but not hooking on the right place, not using the equipment correctly, or taking risks just because they're wearing a harness. So, um, you know, a bit of a familiarisation. There's formal training happening, but it needs to be more internal with what you're doing with your job and how you're applying the machine. Um, log books, big lack of log books and pre-start checks. Although some of the machines that are owned by the companies have got good procedures, we have found that some higher companies have let it slip with supplying um, operator manuals, log books, and um, can conducting pre-start checks. So. Um, that's something we'll try to feed back to those associations. Little things that might seem minor, but just give an indication to the inspector that did you really check this machine? This is quite a large crane. And I know it's a hole, so we ask what goes in that hole. The pin that goes in that hole to stop the stabilizers or the outriggers um, going down in case there's an emergency are gone. And they never were there. So it only took them two hours to rectify it, but you know, this is a dead giveaway. There's a hole there, should there be a pin in it? Same crane, unfortunately. So a bit, bit of excessive leakage. It was current, it was a hide machine, and um, you know, given out leaks like this, unfortunately, same machine. Most of these pictures are less than two weeks old, a couple of days old here in Christchurch. Most of these are in Christchurch. You know. What they've actually done is actually spent some time on their people and developed their people and working out there and giving the responsibility back to those guys and making them take a bit of ownership. Foreman and pl planning and housekeeping, they were key management tasks. Foreman responsibility. Over the last probably 10 years in New Zealand, I what Fulton Hogan with, with the way the act has been going, we've been pulling that stuff away and giving it to our managers. You're the manager, you manage safety. That is wrong, we've decided. What we want to try and do there is take it back to the foreman and get them involved in a bit of ownership. Then work together with their foreman and their people to actually work out what they're doing out in the field so they can have some ownership. Worksite in the UK, full PPE is worn over there, um, there as well as the US. Um, what they have over there, they have actually have field marshals. So you've got a guy on the left hand corner which has got a blue barrier. He's responsible and will not allow anybody into that worksite. So when they, if they're doing some concrete laying through there and the concrete truck is due to be there at 1 o'clock and he arrives at 10, they'll actually go along and say, no, the plan was you arrive at 1. Either go away and come back at 1 o'clock or you need to stay there and wait until we make the site safe. So how many times do we get that pressure put on our people? So that's how strict they are. When we drove up the site, when the vehicle was there, we had to wait 25 minutes. And I'm with the CEO of that business and he said, no, that's the rules. He has that authority. And when you go past a piece of plant, they do stop the, mach the machine. We put it into a safety mode, but we let it idle. Over there, they turn the machine off. Then you go past the machine. So that is something else that we'll bring into our business. The play a work site in the US, they've got 30 people working on the site, and you can't see a damn person anywhere. And they've only got one machine. This is where the housekeeping comes into it. If that was a New Zealand site, we'd have utes parked everywhere, we'd have rollers parked everywhere, and the poor old guy on the grader's got to go this way to work his way through it all. So that's what we say about housekeeping, and that's what certainly came up over in the States. There's no work site. That's laying a um, five-lane motorway through the US, all on concrete. Again, it's so clean, absolutely spotless. And people cared about their activity. So if you're an employer, you need to make sure that your staff are trained and you've documented that training. You need to make sure that your staff are supervised to a point where they are experienced. Uh, we would look at that as being coached along and it would be very prudent of you to document that sort of training and experience. This chap was a young chap who'd recently qualified as an operator. Uh, all his previous experience had been working on the flat he changed jobs uh, to a contractor that was specialised in infill housing and drove a, started operating a new machine. What had happened was it was a, quite a tight site. He's been working up on the left-hand side there on the, um, above the retaining wall and he couldn't swing his boom round towards the house, so he had to swing 
over the retaining wall. And what he did is he lowered the boom with some dirt and it toppled out. Now, in his training, he had been taught to wear a seat belt. So two things saved him, the operator protective structure and the seat belt. So all he had to do was undo the seat belt and walk away. So he walked away from that accident. And many accidents I've investigated in the past, if the operator stays in the machine and wears the seat belt, he'll go home. This is an absolute tragedy. This is a self-employed contractor who'd been a diesel mechanic who wanted to get into construction, bought that machine second hand, although it was a fairly new machine, paid, I think, $11,000 for it, asked the guy who sold it to him to show him how to operate it. I think within 20 minutes he was driving it up onto the trailer, taking it home, and he became a self-employed contractor doing specialising in, in full housing. Prior to that, he'd been driving a little dingo, a little mobile wheelbarrow, drilling post holes. He saw an opportunity in the market, bought that machine. Now what's happened here, he's gone onto a sloping site, and you can probably tell what's happened, he's using ramps to get up the stairs. Don't do that, if you see that. Um, what's happened is he was a bit unsure about uh, balancing the machine, so he had a labourer standing on the bucket as he drove up the ramps. What's happened is the um, ramp on the left-hand side has slid back, the excavator's slid back, the labourer's jumped off, the machine's rotated and turned left. Now, unfortunately for the operator in this machine, he chose to jump out because he wasn't wearing a seat belt. And basically what happened, he's been caught between the dipper arm and the tree. When we arrived on site, he was lying down here with a sheet over him. <coughs> so that could have been a multiple fatality. Um, now, he had no experience and he wasn't trained and he was a self-employed guy who got into the industry. That's a real risk area. So if you're employing self-employed people or you get contractors coming on your sites, you need to make sure that they are trained, experienced and competent. So I know there are a number of quick hitch systems out there because I see them. Most of the issues that we've encountered are people who use the pin as the secondary device and they're not, they're not installing it. And even last week uh, I was on a site and the guy, uh, I was asking a guy, to, uh, the operator, to demonstrate to the trainee how the quick hitch worked, and he said, oh, well, actually, we haven't got the safety pin in. I mean, it's just, I, would, I, don't, know, I don't want to use the word endemic, but it's out there. And yet every other part of their system was, was, was excellent. So you've got to make sure that you've got compatible equipment, check your safety devices are working correctly and engaged. When you're going to uncrowd your dipper arm, shake it vigorously. That seems to be the test that ultimately checks that if it's, if it's uh, attached. And make sure there are no workers in that area. Make sure everyone's clear. It's, you're going to be looking for, ultimately when you're talking to the operator or the site supervisor, what control methods they have for the hazards on site what hazards they've identified, and of course the machine might be the same, but they're uniquely different from where they're working. Um, you want to see what controls have picked up, and of course talking to the operator will sort that. We also want to look at the security of the site, not just for the public and traffic as I talked to earlier, but the other workers in control and around, clearly a, a hazard such as this, but the dangers of the operating machine. So the security around making sure that those not involved in this operation for their well-being and awareness are kept well back. Ask the operator to demonstrate to you, if you'd like, to hear the audible alarms that let the workers around the machine know that it's in travel mode. There will also be a separate but equally sounding type of alarm to let them know that the bucket's being changed over. So a quick check to make sure this machine's alarms and audible uh, alerting systems are working. Quick, easy demonstration. The motion of the machine turning to do its work is called slewing. And that practice is extremely important to the operation, but is also extremely hazardous. You want to make sure that everything in its slew zone is known. The operator needs to be aware of what is a potential strike hazard, not of course just obstacles, power lines, other machinery. 
in constructions, but of course people, and that's the changing variable, people entering into slough, slough zones. So being aware when approaching and looking at where the slough zone is and the fact that it's ever changing. Blind spots are a constant concern for the operator. While he's working right now, I'm in a great blind spot. He's got mirrors, but very rarely can he see me unless he's deliberately looking at the mirrors. He's focusing on the job he's doing. So a blind spot exists around most or two thirds of where the operator's sitting from his right hand side right round. That changes continually. The blind spot uh, increases and decreases as he's slowing. And of course, there is always going to be work in and around the machine for the other workers to be aware of his move movements. One of the safe places to approach the operator and get the operator's attention will therefore be, of course, on his side and to his front where he can clearly see me and stop should we need to have a chat.